Julie, thank you for talking to me. Can you tell me why marriage equality is such an important issue to you? That's a very interesting question. I, I can only answer it by saying that um, way back in the... Uh, the idea that I could get married and have a family and have a, a fully normal life, I think has always been my goal. I know normal's considered a problematic word, but... Um, back in the 90s, I was asked to speak at the Sydney Institute, which is often described as a, uh, a conservative uh, sort of think tank uh, um, run by uh, Jared Henderson and also his wife. Um, and I was asked to talk on any topic I liked, and I chose gay marriage then, which was considerably before it became uh, a well-known public issue. I suppose my simplest answer would be, ever since I thought I was gay, what I wanted was full equality. I wanted homosexuality to no longer be a mental illness, uh, and we achieved that in, in the 70s in Australia. Um, I wanted decriminalisation, and uh, so it was no longer against the law, uh, and we achieved that in New South Wales in 1984 and in different times in different states into the 90s in Tasmania. And I also wanted it to be acknowledged that it wasn't against God's will, and I think that struggle continues, but we note that the Uniting Church um, does allow uh, openly gay and lesbian people to be ordained as ministers. So there's been a lot of progress. And for me, on the legal front, equality before the law is equality before the law. So I don't want a civil union, a, a modified version of the primary institution of marriage. I want access to that primary equality of also being able to have marriage that is utterly equal. And I think it has uh, profound positive implications for one's relationships and uh, the raising of children. <laughs> you were one of the original 78ers. You were at the first Mardi Gras in 1978 and you were, have been protesting about gay rights and civil rights before then from the mid-70s onwards yeah. when you were very young. Many of those I speak to who are 78ers consider themselves liberationists and marriage equality to some of them is a very conservative institution. Mm -hmm. How do you convince or reassure them? Oh, well, I don't seek to convince or reassure, to be honest with you. I, I, to me, it's just a matter of equality before the law and us as individuals being able to make our own choices. So I'm not wanting to advocate marriage to others who don't want it. My answer personally to those issues is when I was a very... Um, I first thought I was gay when I was about 13 or 14. Um, I didn't get to university, obviously, until I was 18. I was lucky enough to get to university in 1972, uh, which was when uh, the waves of hope from gay liberation in the United States were starting to break on the shores of Australia. So I was able to meet people who told me it was a normal part of the human spectrum of behaviour, which was terribly important to me when I was young. Um, and I, when I realised how unacceptable homosexuality was, I had the sort of anger and distress that many people feel. And I did, I was one of the people who talked about smashing the family. I look back on that now and I see it as sort of naive, youthful pain. I agree with conservatives who say that the family is the core institution of society. Uh, by that, again, I'm not trying to make anybody do anything they don't want to do. I just happen to think that what I have now in my life, a 19-year-long a, a relationship with my partner, Melissa Gibson, having helped her raise two children that she had from a prior heterosexual relationship, uh, Luke and Amelia, who are now both in their mid-twenties but were three and six when I met them, uh, working with their dad in a, in a, in a, a kind of triumvirate of child-raising, that has been a profoundly positive experience. And um, uh, I, um, a couple of years ago, was diagnosed with stage four throat cancer, which was a very obviously a serious and life-threatening challenge. And uh, when I was in chemotherapy, I said to my partner, Melissa, look, I've always thought we'd wait until marriage was uh, uh, available here in Australia. But just in case it takes longer than I have life on this earth, if I get through this chemo and this radiation therapy, let's go to New York and get married. And so we did that about a year after my diagnosis, when the treatment was finished. We went to Manhattan on a well-worn path for many Australians and uh, were married in New York. 
And when I returned, I go to a, a, a uniting church in Redfern, they're called South Sydney Uniting Church. Uh, the local minister, uh, a man called Andrew Collis, who's not himself gay, but who welcomes um, everybody <laughs> who wants to come to church. He and a, a woman called Dorothy McCray McMahon, who was a retired Uniting Church minister and also lives as an openly gay woman after a long marriage and has four kids. Um, they conducted a blessing service to a packed church. Now, why am I mentioning all this? Um, our two adult children came to New York and they were thrilled. My friends and family came to the blessing at South Sydney Uniting Church. And if you'd been in that room, and many of my friends were not particularly support, who were gay, were not supporters of gay marriage, uh, but no one could fail to be moved by the sense of joy and affirmation and celebration in that church. Now, obviously, partly it was that it was a, a wedding, not a funeral, you know, in the sense of where I'd been, but it wasn't just that. They saw the joy in the kids' faces, uh, they saw the affirmation of that relationship. And I can say that it has deepened my relationship with Melissa and very much deepened our connection to the children. So my view is that marriage, for those who wish it, <laughs> um, and, that, and that may well be a minority of the gay and lesbian community, but I frankly doubt it, um, is, it is a deep cultural institution that has the, the capacity to move um, one's inner life and one's sense of one's own identity in ways that many people don't anticipate. Uh, you know, I think it is a really deep thing, marriage. Um, so that's quite a lengthy answer, but uh, my primary message to people like Dennis Altman, a very famous and, and esteemed advocate for homosexual equality in Australia, a man I deeply respect. Uh, we went on Compass, which is a religious program on ABC television run by Geraldine Duke, probably about two years ago, and we had a very vehement disagreement, you know, very different views uh, about marriage. He saw it in the terms that you say, just really an unnecessary matter. Um, I re more recently, we went on a special Q&A to discuss, um, uh, well, the wonderful follow-up to uh, um, a, rock, a, a documentary called A Rock and a Hard Place, which was a follow-up on Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, that famous Australian film that looked at issues for transgender people. Um, but we also talked about gay marriage. And Dennis has shifted a bit and says that he now acknowledges that, for many people, it's become a sort of iconic symbol of achieving full equality. And I think it is an iconic symbol of achieving full equality, but for me it's a much more personal and uh, human yearning. Do you think it's part of the natural evolution of gay issues, LGBTQI issues? Because in 1978 and back in the 70s, was it even on the agenda back then, or is it something that's just evolved? Uh, I'd answer that is that I'm very wary of generalisations and I don't think history is necessarily linear, <laughs> you know, it leaps about. But uh, um, I am sure there would have been gay and lesbian people who wanted full equality before the law and would have liked to get married, but they weren't on the, f uh, they did not have a voice on the, the primary group of people that I was amongst who were fighting for gay liberation and we were radical left. Most of us were radical left and we weren't just active on gay liberation, we were active on um, land rights for Aboriginal people, on uh, equality for uh, women, on um, uh, uh, unionised labour, uh, transforming the workforce, uh, uh, medically supervised and safe abortion. <laughs> you know, we, we were on about many progressive left-wing radical ideas and amongst them was uh, the decriminalisation of homosexuality, the removal of it from the DSM, the American Psychiatric Diagnostic Statistical Manual that declared it uh, a mental illness, and to uh, a fight for equality within churches and the defence forces. Now when you got to churches and the defence forces, there were some left-wing people, way back then even, because the demos that I got involved in began in about 73, long before the, what became the Mardi Gras. Um, when you talk to some people about the defence forces and the churches, there were always some left-wing people who saw them as institutions of the state that were conservative, and that word conservative was used in a derogatory fashion. 
Uh, and I would put myself in a group of people who quite early on thought, no, I reckon equality is equality, and leave it to individuals to have a choice. Do you see the difference between yes. group behaviour or the focus on the individual? And I think I'm a, a progressive left-wing person who's always felt comfortable with choice for the individual. So just, that's a, that's a long-winded answer, but... Uh, I, I, I jokingly call myself the friendly suburban face of Australian lesbianism and what I mean by that is I think my yearnings are pretty mainstream and that I became an angry activist and demonstrator and got arrested and even spent some periods of time in Malawa women's prison um, getting rather than paying uh, the fines. I was driven to that by the totally negative responses of every aspect of the then establishment to homosexuality. I either accepted that I was a sick and dirty, mentally ill criminal who had to not have a relationship for the rest of my life to be accepted in the eyes of God. That's one option. Or I had to question everything and fight for my instinctive sense that I was a, a good person who happened to be sexually attracted to women, and that that was only one part of my identity. So I chose the latter. And like a lot of people, my approach and views on, on the issues generally changed as I aged. Many people become a little bit more conservative as they age, and you could say that about me if you like. But, but I personally think equality before the law is equality before the law. I have a law degree, and I believe in the rule of law, and I want to be equal. You've mentioned you're a member of the Uniting Church. How do you reassure people who perhaps oppose marriage equality on, say, religious, cultural or traditional grounds? It's interesting you keep asking me to reassure mm. people. I, I, I'm not sure that... I see this as a, a rights issue. And, you know, many people feel anxious about living next door to people from other races. But I, that doesn't mean I want to reassure them. Well, I suppose it's an interesting word, reassure. Or how do you counter them? When they say, perhaps, God believes marriage, the Bible says marriage is between a man and a woman, or a traditionalist says to you, this is the way it's always been. Or yeah. somebody from a different cultural background says, this isn't how we do it. What response do you give to them, or do you not give them one at all? Oh, yes, no, no, I was recently on Q&A, and I very much responded to that. Um, look... Uh, I, um, I don't believe that through intellectual debate you can influence the opinion of people who currently deeply feel homosexuality to be wrong and against God's will, either for religious or cultural reasons. I actually don't think that it is ever, probably shifted as a point of view through rational debate. I say that with some regret, because I believe in rational debate and evidence. I personally think, if you're going to say what will shift people, I think it's who have those very strong views in this current era, it's more likely to be that someone they know or love or a member of their family turns out to be gay or transgender, and then they are forced to approach this question not in a sort of objective intellectual way but rather in an emotional way do I never see my sister again am I really saying that my brother should never experience the comfort and joy of sharing their life with someone so I'm a great believer in coming out that's why I turn up here today to do this interview or go on the media I think that the more of us who are able to just openly share our life and talk about who we are a complex people not just a sexual identity the more likely we are to reach out to people on the emotional level uh, and thus possibly shift opinion. Um, a more intellectual answer would be to say that within the Christian community, the Jewish community, and even some parts of the Islamic community, uh, although fewer there, there are people who do not literally believe in the interpretation of the Old or the New Testament or the Quran as a literal text to be read literally. Rather, there are scholars who for many decades and even beyond have seen these um, Abrahamic faiths with their important books 
as particularly these books as really important documents worthy of discussion but open to many different interpretations and so there are bishops who are gay and lesbian in the Episcopalian Church, the equivalent of the Anglican Church um, in the United States, uh, in uh, Britain. Um, here in Australia, the United Church accepts uh, gay and lesbian people. So there are clearly Christ sincere Christians who see it differently. But the approach I took when I was uh, recently on television with the Reverend Fred Nile, who very much argues a traditional view that it is utterly unacceptable to God, um, is to be respect to extend respect as I want respect uh, extended to me, to give him space to speak, and myself uh, then c can justifiably ask for space to speak. But I don't think I'm going to shift someone like Fred Nile through intellect. Politicians. Why have many Australian politicians been so slow to come on board? It's a very interesting question. I'll offer a couple of thoughts and I have no idea as to their accuracy. Um, I think um, it, when it comes... I think individuals have made a difference, so people have made a difference. So I think that Tony Abbott, our current Prime Minister, um, is a sincere Catholic who uh, strives genuinely <laughs> to follow the uh, uh, leadership of the Church, the Vatican and the Pope, um, and it, it would be very hard for him indeed to shift his position because of his deep personal connection and affection for the Catholic Church. Now, oddly enough, if we go to another very influential person in the Liberal Party in Australia, John Howard, and a long-term Prime Minister, he's a Sydney Anglican. And by a quirk of history, Sydney Anglicans lead the world in their opposition to the acceptance of homosexuality and they build uh, uh, relationships with uh, African uh, parts of the church to oppose progressive parts of the Anglican church that can be found in the United Kingdom and the United States. So again, it's just one of those quirks of history. Then we look to the Labor Party and... Because the Labor Party is, is so heavily reliant on financing from the union movement and their internal systems give disproportionate voting power to unions and because there is um, a very powerful union uh, often referred to as the Shoppies that is led by, has until recently been led by Joe De Bruin who is a, a practising Catholic of uh, deep conservatism with a, uh, a demonstrated history of using his union power to um, hold the line against a progressive reform on social issues. And because Julia Gillard, who we, we may have seen some hope there as a progressive woman, a secular woman, a woman unmarried herself, um, but therefore you know, willing to take on social attitudes, Many people hoped, I think, that perhaps Julia Gillard might show some leadership within the Labor Party. But instead, I think she was heavily dependent on votes uh, from the shoppies, uh, shop distributors and allied union or something, I think it's called. Um, I've interviewed her about that in front of audiences and uh, she uh, would reject that and argue that uh, she has a feminist view of marriage. What I say to that is that... that completely underestimates and lacks to give credit to those of us as ageing feminists who fought to change marriage. Marriage in Australia uh, and the Family Law Act is a very progressive institution that's good for children and uh, is uh, good for both parties on separation if that's required. So it's a modified and open thing, marriage in Australia. It's not medieval marriage. It's something quite different. Um, so... I guess what I'm saying in a nutshell is that I think key leaders of our Commonwealth Government, and remember the Marriage Act is a Commonwealth Act, and so to change it we need to change the Commonwealth Marriage Act, had these particular reasons for not showing leadership. The one other thing I'll quickly add, and I haven't heard anyone else say it, but you know we were originally a convict nation, and the any sort of progressive help, whether it was education or f welfare, food help, help if you were ill or sick or whatever, protection of children, was done by church-based charities right from the beginning because it was a prison. 
And so the Anglican Church, which predominantly was associated with the officer class and the government, and the Catholic Church, which was predominantly associated with the Irish convicts, which were a massive part of our immigration, both those churches played a, have played right from the first days of white settlement a really influential role in Australian political life and civil life. And in the last few decades, government at both state and federal level has outsourced an amazing amount of um, progressive services, child protection, health and welfare, to the Catholic and Anglican church-run charities. And so I think they have a, a genuine influence at senior level. Uh, and I think that was illustrated in that very, very sad day while Julia Gillard was Prime Minister, when Nicola Roxon, who was then the Labor Attorney General, appeared in Canberra at a major pro-conventional marriage rally that was really a rally to oppose acceptance of same-sex marriage. And Nicola Roxon spoke at it in saying that they would not support same-sex marriage. And I think that reflected uh, the influence of both uh, Catholic-based unions and the Catholic and Anglican Church in uh, service delivery in Australia. You've talked about the Roman Catholic Church and Irish migrants and convicts. Mm. Obviously, we've just had the referendum in Ireland. It's a fantastic result. Mm. And hopefully it's provided some momentum here. It appears to. What do you say to people who perhaps would rather have a plebiscite or a referendum? Look, I don't have a view on that. I know people have very strong views either way. And, uh, um, you know, a, a plebiscite is expensive and would bring delay. Um, I, I, so I understand people's hesitation. Um, and uh, there is significant evidence, as I understand it, that the Australian population is open uh, to support for same-sex marriage and therefore you could argue uh, let leaders take it to Parliament and let the people speak in terms of who they vote for next time. But to be honest with you, I'm open-minded on that. Um, I, I'm not put off by a plebiscite. I think it would... I th I'd see the advantage of it as there would be a massive conversation about homosexuality. And the reason I turn up to do interviews like this uh, and any of the other public stuff I do is predominantly for teenagers who are experiencing for the first time the possibility that they may be same-sex attracted. And I personally think that even with all the openness and discussion there is now compared to the 60s when I was growing up when it was all silent and all so dark, but even now I think it's all, it generally is a traumatic experience within the family context for young people. So the advantage of a plebiscite is that there would be an extraordinary debate that would cause a lot of people to hear a lot of both negative and positive information about homosexuality, but at least it would be a major issue. Um, but I can also see the argument that enough's enough, that the equivalent English-speaking nations, Canada, uh, the United States and Britain, uh, let alone Ireland, um, have shown the way and that a progressive society, a secular, predominantly society like Australia, um, sh should hurry up and catch up. A couple more questions. What do you think the timeline for marriage equality is? And do you think it's inevitable? Oh, it's definitely inevitable. Um, I, I would be astounded if it didn't happen within five years. Um, but... You know, and I, I did have stage four cancer, so I am only two years out of treatment, and I, I would dearly love to still be alive uh, when it's when it happens in Australia. And I, and I may well live a long time. I hope I do. But you know, when you've had stage four cancer, there's always the possibility of recurrence. Um, but I don't think it'll be quick, for the reasons that I've said. I, I, I think the Catholic and Anglican churches are disproportionately influential in Australian political life for the reasons I outlined earlier. So I, I think it might take a while. Will that be a lot to do with Tony Abbott or will it be with other ministers and politicians? Well, I, I, um, one would expect Malcolm Turnbull, to, if should he assume the leadership of the Liberal Party, to be more open-minded. But uh, my understanding is, and I'm not by any means an expert on this, but my understanding is that there are within the Liberal Party uh, 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 Protestant people as well as Catholic people who are deeply opposed 
to same-sex marriage. It really matters to them. And so I think it will not be easy to bring it through the Liberal Party. And I've already said that the Labor Party, I still think, is strongly influenced by uh, unions that have taken a very conservative stance on this social issue. So I think both our major parties are just, for historical reasons, lagging behind the general public. So we've uh, covered quite a lot of issues here so mm. far. Do you think the fight and campaign for LGBTQIA equality and rights finishes with marriage equality? Oh no, of course not. Uh, of course what not. What is there to fight for? Oh, uh, 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 what are, uh, I'm, I'm just hesitating with the word fight. Look, uh, let me put it this way. Throughout history, there have been homosexual, same-sex attracted people and transgender people. I think the intersex people see themselves as different and have a different set of issues, but I know they're often included in our alphabet soup. I prefer the term rainbow people at this point in my life. Um, but, but at the human level, sorting out who you are and what it means for you, um, I think will have significant and sensitive relevance for many decades to come, regardless of the law. Secondly, as we know, there are still many countries in the world where homosexuality is either illegal or even subject to the death penalty. Australia is a multicultural society, and why I'm still a passionate supporter of Mardi Gras all these years later is that every year there are new cultural groups who march, uh, and you have these small groups from different um, cultural and ethnic backgrounds who are bravely making a stand for the first time. So it's going to be many, many decades before all nations um, have decriminalised, have sorted out their psychiatric services and eliminated homosexuality as a mental illness. And it will be a considerable time before all the faith groups um, accept and welcome homosexuals as people equally capable of a good life, a partnered life, in the eyes of God. So the, I guess the struggle, the fight will continue. But why I put it in inverted commas is that within a society like Australia, I think the best thing we can do is the sort of thing that I've tried to do, which is to be open with our partners and our children and to just sh share our lives with people. That that, as it were, soft diplomacy is most appropriate in the Australian context. But I'm not a, a Muslim 13-year-old who's same-sex attracted in South West Sydney. I'm sure they'd find the word fight and struggle still very appropriate. And my final question is always, what can people do who support marriage equality get in to do to get involved in the campaign? Well, I think we should do whatever we can do, you know, whatever we feel comfortable doing. Obviously the Mar Marriage Equality Campaign have websites and so on that give us many ideas. Um, but uh, the more we speak up within our workplaces, our families and our friendship groups, if we look at a great change like the 1967 referendum for Aboriginal people, of course there was public demonstrations, there was lobbying of parliamentarians, there was uh, uh, public meetings in halls and so on across the country. But to an enormous degree, it was conversations with friends and families and co-workers so that it becomes a personal and a human issue not a, that, that's about people and about love. Um, so I think talking to whoever you mix with about it openly is great. Julie McCrossan, thank you very <laughs> thank much. Thank you.